Welcome to the Rhino Podcast, brought to you by Rhino Records. Interviews with your favorite artists and bands about the songs and albums you love. Here's your host, Rich Mahan. On this episode of the Rhino Podcast, we speak with Henry Rollins and Rhino A&R Jason Jones about the 50th anniversary of the Stooges' classic album, Funhouse. Welcome back to the Rhino Podcast, friends. Great things are afoot at rhino.com, you should be aware of, including the announcement of the new Eagles Live from the Forum Super Deluxe 4LP 2CD Blu-ray set, which captures a 26-song performance by the band recorded live over a three-night run at the Los Angeles Forum in September 2018. Release date is October 16th of this year, but it's available for pre-order now. And just released in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of Grateful Dead's Working Man's Dead, it's Angel Share, a two and a half hour collection of studio outtakes from the original recording sessions. Angel Share offers a fly on the studio wall perspective, revealing how this classic album was made. For more info on Angel Share, visit dead.net. And check out this cool MC5 deal. It's the Total Assault 50th Anniversary Collection on three red, white, and blue LPs. A copy of Wayne Kramer's book on his time in the MC5 entitled The Hard Stuff and a book plate signed by Wayne Kramer himself. It's all going on at rhino.com. And don't forget to sign up for the Rhino Insider Rewards Program so you get the credit for the purchases you make. Today on the podcast, we have the one and only Henry Rollins on with our own Jason Jones from Rhino A&R to talk about the Stooges Funhouse 50th Anniversary Deluxe Edition. This historic release comes out on July 31st. It's a massive 15 LP box set that includes every take from the entire Funhouse recording sessions at Electra Studios in Los Angeles. Included in the set is a 45 RPM 12 inch version of the original record on two LPs. And there's also a live show from that time as well entitled Have Some Fun Live at Ungano's. It's available for pre-order now and there are less than 100 copies left out of the 1,970 being made. So jump on it if you're interested. Singer, songwriter, spoken word artist, and actor Henry Rollins wrote the liner notes for this collection. And I don't think there could have been a better choice for the job. The notes are a joy to read, and it's evident how important Funhouse is to Henry, and you'll hear his obvious enthusiasm in the conversation I had with him and Jason Jones. There's so much great material, we're breaking this into two episodes, so without further ado, let us enter the Funhouse. Henry Rollins and Jason Jones, welcome to the Rhino Podcast. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. So glad to have you guys here today to talk about the 50th anniversary of one of the greatest rock albums ever recorded, Funhouse. You put this reissue together, which is massive in size physically, and I can only imagine it was massive in the undertaking as well. It's Jason who did all the heavy lifting, and it's it's a suitcase of records. I mean, it's this big box. Yeah. And I think that's a lot in this day and age to say to a label, hey, put out a 50-year-old record that is a, a suitcase of vinyl without any real guarantee on how well it's going to sell, but it sure is good. And to their credit, Rhino did it. I was amazed when I met up with Jason that this thing was going through. This is a fan's record. Yeah. And yeah. it's the kind of thing where I wanted it. As soon as I heard the CD box set, I wanted the vinyl many years ago. And I used to write about it, like someone should do this. And then when I met Jason, he said, well, it's being done. I was like, wow, that's gutsy. It was a very large undertaking to try and get it over the line. 
you know, for me, just as a fan, to me, it's the most, it's the most obvious thing to do whenever you're trying to celebrate such a key, important landmark anniversary around, as you said, Rich, one of the greatest albums ever made, you know? And I think that we had the good fortune that all the tapes survived, which is not the case with a lot of really great albums. Because you're really, you're taking the journey with the band throughout the creative process of recording this record. You know, you would think that the way that Fun House sounds initially, you would think, oh, this was, you know, one or two takes. It's real loose. It's real raw. But it's, it's all there. It's all very studied. It's all very considered. There's a looseness to it, but it's very, very intentional what they yeah. are doing on right. this record. Like, you yeah. really are hearing lightning captured on tape. Yeah, and I think it's, it's worth uh, mentioning because a lot of people might not know that tape gets purged when there is a shelf of outtakes sitting somewhere after a few decades. At some point, they just clean house and it becomes one of those things you read about in a biography. Oh, there was outtakes and we tried to find them and no one knows where they are. So it's very lucky. And I think in the liner notes, we describe this as like Tutankhamun's site because the only reason the grave robbers didn't get to it and empty it was they didn't know it was there. And yeah. the fact that the tape was in great condition. Kudos to Bill Inglot back yes. in 1999 for having the forethought to try and put the original box together, uh, the original CD box. You know, unfortunately... They had Rhino Handmade ready to go. You know, they had kind of a, Rhino had a surefire avenue to get people to order this thing and to ensure that they, you know, would be financially successful because yeah. it was limited edition. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of doing the same thing with this box. It's just, you know, that CD box weighs, you know, two pounds <laughs> and this one weighs, you know, let's add a couple of, you know, 20 or 30 pounds on top of that. I, like Henry, always wanted to experience it on vinyl. And believe me, listening to the test pressings, it's an entirely different experience. Yes. I can tell you from sitting on my couch every night doing one or two LPs a night, I mean, there was at one point where I'm in my whatever take of 1970 and I was almost tearing up. It's like almost like a meditation when you hear the songs over and over again. It's not boring because you can hear the differences. You can hear the band putting that song under the microscope and they're just making these tiny changes. Rhythm section shifting a little. Iggy's moving on different lyrics. Uh, Ron's trying different stuff. And at like three or four takes in, it just becomes like this one long mantra. And I found myself kind of rocking back and forth in this kind of like just still amazement as to what I was hearing, where there's like this momentum to it. Like you think you're on a fast moving train. It's incredible. Yeah, you get to hear them fine tune the arrangements. Oh, absolutely. And it's this oh, yeah. instinctive thing. The Stooges had a musical ability that you can't learn in school, you show up with it. Like when you hear a drummer who's a natural, where they just pick up their friend's sticks and like, start like, oh, like this? You're like, wow, I took two years of lessons to sound like yeah. you did after 20 minutes. Yeah, right. The Stooges in their own way all had that. Remember, uh, Ron Ashton, I believe was 21 when he made that record. He would be 22 soon. Think about that and then listen to the song Dirt and wonder how a guy that young gets a feel like that at that age. like at that age, I couldn't find it with either hand or both hands. 
And yeah. you know what I mean? Like as far as just my life in general, and you hear how much music that guy's got in him and his brother, Scott, he's a drummer's drummer. And like what he has, you have it or you don't. And he's got like five truckloads of it. And yeah. everyone and you know, Dave Alexander, the same thing, Steve McKay. And then, then, and then there's Iggy. And then there's this other thing, the sum of the parts. And then beyond that, there's Don Gallucci and Brian Ross Myring, the producer and the engineer. And it's this incredible combination of people, studio, environment, all coming together where it's kind of uncanny how well it worked. And, um, you know, there's a lot to talk about with this record. And I don't think we should go much further before we talk about the producer and the engineer who were able to understand what the Stooges needed to make yeah. Funhouse sound like it sounds. Because if you listen to rock records of that time, the guitars are almost muted. They're, they're recorded at low volume. Everything is partitioned off. There's no bleed. It doesn't sound like when you go to a gig and everything is all, you know, cooking with each other and you get that whole overall body immersion. It's all, you know, chaperones everywhere. And Funhouse is like being thrown into a stew pot. And that's Don Gallucci watching the band play and then thinking this studio must be changed. And he literally just started moving things around this very dead room built for acoustic recordings, yeah. so, like folk music. Yeah. And he saw that. And he's, he was young too. He was like 20 something. All these people. Yeah. Were young. He was, yeah. He was like 24, 25, something like that. Like uh, Iggy he was 23. And I think Brian was like 20, 21. Yeah. I mean, these are a bunch of young people and, and hats off to Jack Holtzman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just to go, okay, youngsters, here's a really expensive recording studio. Because um, Jason and I put Don through his paces for hours. You guys actually interviewed both Don and the publicist who served as the de facto A&R person. Yeah, for, for hours and hours. Yeah. Danny Fields, who, who signed them, who's a fascinating person. Like you, a legend. That, a that's, legend. A doc, that's a documentary uh, that you need to watch right now. I mean, he yeah. will blow your mind. Just the fact that one guy saw and is responsible for so much culture. You yeah. can't believe it's embodied in one man. What's the yeah. name of his documentary? Danny Says. Danny Says. Yeah, after the Ramon song. Five times, I think I've seen it. Yeah. Sitting in his apartment is a mind blow because he just has all these crazy pieces of history just kind of sitting around. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, he casually mentions the Marble Index by Nico. And he said, yeah, he, she got that out of this book. And he pulls off this book. And he's like, what, she had a copy of the book? He said, oh, no, no, it was this copy. I said, I'm holding the same book Nico was holding. Ah! And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and, he's, and he's so like, yeah, okay. And, and I, just, I put the book down on the table between us and I just sat and kind of stared at it the rest of the afternoon like that, yeah. that happened. And yeah. I'm holding, that's Danny. Danny's got yeah. five buses of those stories. And he's the one who signed the Stooges. And signed, signed, signed the MC5 and, and Stooges MC5. On, the exact yeah. side, on the exact same day. Yeah, exact same thing. He put them yeah. all in one room and he uh, got on the phone with Jack Holtzman and, and they made the deal on the phone in real time. Mm -hmm. And and the deal was done. And that's why you have all those records. And, you know, arguably these bands would have been signed perhaps somewhere at some point. But these records happened the way they did because Danny got it rolling. And obviously the bands take it from there. But, you know, the, the Stooges came from Michigan all the way out to Los Angeles. And I think they landed on Iggy's birthday, April 21st, 1970. I don't know if any of them had ever been to Los Angeles. And they were housed up the street and around the corner at the Tropicana, a, a legendary rock hotel that's now gone. And so they were living on Santa Monica Boulevard. And every day they'd leave, they'd walk east on Santa Monica, make a right turn, go south on La Cienega for about a city block, up the stairs and into Electra. And they'd go into that room and basically uh, just kind of um, stare at Brian Ross Myring and Don Gallucci through the glass. <laughs> Don, Don is really funny and very, very humble and very talented. Yeah. He said the Stooges did 
day after day, they did the funhouse sessions to two people. They would just stare through the glass at us like two men in suits who they did not trust. Well, let's back up just a a hair about that, because if you talk about the first Stooges record, which was produced by John Cale, there we go, tying back into Velvet Underground, Nico. And they did that one in New York. That one was recorded kind of in the way that, you know, they separate all the instruments, trying to get things perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the genius things that Don realized was that wasn't going to work for this band and this record. What did he do differently at Elektra to break the mold and really get the fire of this band on tape? He removed all the baffling. I mean, they basically broke down that studio. And whenever Henry and I saw the actual room that they recorded it in, it's not very big at all. Like Don told us that he saw the band at Ngano's yep. in early 1970. Feb 70, he flew Feb out 70. to New York. Yeah. And, and by that, April, he had him in the studio. Yeah, had him in the studio. And the first thing that he said that he experienced was just the visceral just power and force of them on the stage. And apparently he went back to Jack Holtzman and said, there's no way that you can record this band. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And Jack said, well, too bad. We got dates booked. You got to do it somehow. You got to figure it, and it it's out. Your, it's your band. And it's your band now. Yeah, yes. He was, he was assigned the Stooges. Like if you said to any rock band, here's your producer, and they don't know the guy, that would not go down very, if the band was any good, yeah. they yeah. would have an idea of their own. They, would, they wouldn't, wouldn't go, oh, okay, in those yeah. days. Right. And, and Don shows up in a suit and tie to the studio and the stooges <laughs> you're like they're not suit and tie types uh, and they, they call them at, norms wasn't that the term they used norms? yes uh, norms yeah. and it was ron who knew who don was from i believe his band don and the good times also yep. i think the band all kind of collectively dug the fact that don played keyboard on louis louis with the kingsmen at age 15 <laughs> that's pretty cool it's totally cool but past yeah. that It was the Electra establishment trying to record. And apparently some members of the band were friendlier than others. And and Don, 50 years on, is really funny about all this stuff. And and we have it in the liner notes. We have a lot of Don in the liner notes because it is what it is. There's not a lot of people left to talk about the sessions. Like who was there? We're down to like a couple of people. Yeah. So that's why we kept Don... Uh, pinned to a seat all afternoon, kind of just like squeezing him like this intellectual orange to get every possible <laughs> anecdotal <laughs> drop of juice out of him. But he yeah, was, it was three. It was a it was a brilliant, like almost four hour conversation that wow. Henry and I had with Don just about Funhouse, and he his recall is staggering. Yeah, he remembered every single bit of it. He's like, I could see it now. And he would talk about the way that the music made him feel and the colors that he saw. And this is not a dude who was like into psychedelics or anything like that. He was, you know, straight as an arrow. But the same kind of feeling that you get from the record, if you truly know this record, he had that exact same feeling. There's a reason why that record sounds like it sounds. He had a real deep, inadvertent personal connection to these songs and to this band. And it's truly reflective of his care for the way that those songs were recorded and the way that they were put together. And also Brian, as a astoundingly good engineer, fresh from Barbara Streisand sessions, coming in and Wow, what a contrast. Ma- and making it sound there's a reason why that record sounds so good. You can hear the the repartee uh be, you know before they go into a take. It, sa- it sounds like Ross and the Stooges got along. It's funny the way they banter back and forth. And even Iggy, who can, you know, sometimes be, you know, he's kind of like the wolf at the at the edge of the campfire. He's not going to come that close. Even he seemed to get along with Ross. I, I think may, Ross was maybe the warm water, uh, you know, the, the kind of the go-between. There's a thing that Don said in the interview that I thought was fascinating, and, and I, I know Jason's going to remember this. We asked, you know, we kind of went through the whole thing chronologically. And we, we're now we're kind of at like an hour or three or four. And we're kind of, you know, rounding the horn. 
And I said, okay, so the band finishes the sessions. What's mixing like? And he said, well, there's not much to mix in that it is what it is. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, how different are the outtakes in sound to the album? And I said, they sound the same. He said, there you go. It, yeah. It's all on the tape. Yeah. Basically, they just use the levels they recorded with. And, you know, obviously, little EQ, little, little this, little of that. But what you have for the most part, there's a guitar overdub here or there. But yeah. what you have is a bona fide live recording, live vocals, live That's everything. Crazy. Was Iggy in an ISO booth? Did he say no. anything about that? Or was he in the room with the mic, with the amps blaring? Here, here it is. In the room, no separation. Don lined them up like he saw them on stage, like with the bass here, drums there, guitar there, and the singer out front, literally yeah. out front, I think with an EV mic. Yeah. And he said that Iggy would stare at, he'd come right up to the glass <laughs> and just kind of stare at them. And so imagine that for a week in some of your life of like, you know, these young, you know, intense men from the Midwest just kind of glaring at you as they go through this like total savagery. And like, yeah. the lead guys is kind of staring. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, and Don said, we asked Don, we were like, so like, what was the rapport amongst the band? You know, was there like some grand vision or anything like that? And Don was like, no, not really. They didn't really talk much. You know, yeah. was, was there a rapport of like, oh, was that a good take? You know, oh, let's do that one again. And he was like, no, not really. We just kind of knew. We would just kind of look at each other and kind of, you know, we yeah. knew when it was, when the job was done on the particular song that they were recording. Yeah. And in that way, uh, Don kind of became a, you know, a momentary stooge because we asked, you know, like, what, what was it like day to day? He said they'd come in and he wasn't exactly sure the exact time of day, but I, you know, I, I guess they would start, you know, in the daytime. And he said they would just walk in and put their, you know, guitars on. And he said, one thing he said is they didn't even talk much amongst each other. They just got to work. I said, so when do you know it's the take? He said, we all just knew. And so I went through and took notes on all the takes. And except for one song, like maybe 1970, they use the last take. And some of these songs, like Loose, I think they're like, what, there's like 21 takes of it? And yeah. it's just like, it's so... And the lyrics change. I mean, the first mm -hmm. sets of lyrics, uh, and it's very funny. Uh, you, you can, you know, when you get the box set, you can listen for yourself. And Don's like, "Yeah, sure, we'll put that on the radio every day." <laughs> like, and he said something. It's like, "Yeah," he said, uh, "Yeah, we'll have um, we'll have the strippers come into the teachers' luncheon." You like, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, sure, that that'll fly. <laughs> And so finally the lyrics get dialed in and, you know, you have what you have. But again, as Jason said, Don just said, we all knew. And when you listen to all the takes, I would argue that there's no outtake that's better than the master. And so, and I, I say in the liner notes, if one is listening to this box set in hopes of some great epiphany, or some aha moment, like, ah, this is, you're not going to get it. What you're going to get is a band sharpening the scalpel, sharpening, 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 and then they nail the perfect shot, the perfect photo of the moment, and then they move on. As Jason said, you go on the journey with the band. And so here's another thing to consider. Besides the first day when they just got sounds, and that's all recorded too, thankfully, when they got the sounds and they're going for takes, as any band in the studio, you want every song to be one take so you can get the hell out of there and, and like see the daylight. Every take, the band is playing like their lives depend on it. 
So you're not hearing, oh, they're kind of dialing this one in. It's young people playing like their guts are going to come flying out of them. Like when you hear Steve McKay take after take, you're like, oh no, young man, don't explode. He's pushing so hard. And Iggy, every vocal, he's like just screaming. You wonder, how does anyone's vocal cords take that? And I've seen Iggy quite a few times in my life. I've never seen him have a voice problem on stage. I guess he just has it. You know, even now, right. he, you know, he sings kind of in a way better than ever. I mean, he sounds amazing on stage. And I've seen him you know, at all hours, different continents of the world. And I've never seen a night where like, oh, well, poor guy. Because, you know, if you're a singer in a band, you have a bad night. Him and Lux Interior, man, they just didn't seem to have them. And when you hear the Funhouse sessions and you hear them doing loose for like an hour and 15 minutes or something, yeah. it's amazing. How did he not blow his voice out? Right, and he and it's not like he's holding back. He didn't, uh, right? Yeah. And and, and didn't. how how can the drummer stay in the pocket take after take? I don't think the Stooges get a, as much credit as they should as just incredibly instinctive players. Like it, it's like one of Miles Davis's many incredible lineups where everyone is just on some invisible page. Like they just know what needs to be done and they get it done. The Stooges, for a bunch of raw young men, the Funhouse Sessions allows you to see just how damn good they are. Yeah. And that rhythm section, whew, I mean, you just, you just don't get drums hitting that kind of pocket. Well, and they sound so good, too. That's one of the things I've always loved about this record is the drums sound fantastic and they're up front, but they don't overshadow anything else, but they cut. And the tone of the drums is fantastic. And his groove, he's so groovy, but yeah. rocking at the same time. And you know that you can't be taught that. I mean, that that's just like your fingerprints that you, you, you got them, you know, it, it is what you have. And all the great drummers, in, in my opinion, great drummers and great bass players, they're born to play those instruments. Like any great drummer you can name, they're not straight. Like John Bonham, like there's no straight beats in his playing. No. Like, and it's, it's about what he plays as much as what he doesn't play. Mm -hmm. and, and Scott is not a busy drummer. He just finds that pocket. And you're like, wow. And you really hear the band, the, one of my favorite evolutions of a song in the Funhouse Sessions is Down on the Street. I don't know how many times I've played that song. Like I'll meet some young band. I'll go like, youngster, go online. Listen to that. And if you can do something within 10,000 miles of that, you might have something. Because on the outside, it sounds simple. But it's, it's, the song is all feel. It's all instinct. And you hear the take the big difference between that one, which is the one your hair stands up on your arms when you hear yeah. it, it's Scott. Scott leans back the diameter of a hair. That pocket is just, it's the take where all the other ones are good. But the first few takes, you hear him just kind of pushing it, rushing it a tiny bit where it hops out of the pocket. And then they just kind of relax into it. They unleash the power. Down on Don talks about it in the interview. He said, when they got the take, he said, the, the takes are naked. There's hardly any overdubs. If the bass player pops a note wrong, the whole thing, that's all you're going to remember. He said it was all, every master take was cut from one stone. It has to be perfect. And they nailed it take after take. And that's what Funhouse is. Hearing them achieve that, when you hear all the outtakes, that's, I think, one of the, maybe the single most amazing recorded musical journey I've ever been on as far as getting from A to Z with a recording of, a, of, a, of, a, of an iconic record. I mean, who has six and a half, almost seven hours of finished mixed material of maybe the Beatles, but you have to buy the bootlegs to get all of it. Yeah. 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 
Exactly. I mean, what other releases have been given this treatment? I mean, none spring to mind. I, I can't think of any. Not not to this degree, at, at certainly. But you know, the, to me, the best comparison are those like deep dive Miles Davis box sets that you know that yeah. break down the on the corner sessions or the bitches brew sessions or the Jack Johnson sessions. Those are the closest thing that you have, and I think it's a testament to the power of this record that some you know monolithic box set like this exists for a band like the Stooges, which yes. you know if you're if you're a Stooges fan, you're Stooges all the way, and you want everything. And now yes. you have it on vinyl for the very first time. Just to piggyback on what Henry was saying, part of the real joy in taking the ride is hearing the evolution, hearing them almost nailing it, almost nailing it, almost nailing it, and then, bam, it happens. It's a payoff. It's a, it's a complete yeah. payoff. Many, many years ago when I mail-ordered the CD version, I was, you know, because it, it, it is my favorite album. And when I saw I was getting the treatment of all the outtakes, I just simply couldn't believe it. There's a couple of songs was it lost in the future. Yeah. Okay. Many, many years ago, uh, when you were in diaper pants, young man, um, <laughs> back in the, when I was young in the 1880s, um, <laughs> I think it was Trouser Press Magazine. Maybe Peter Gabriel was on the cover. They did a thing on Funhouse or Iggy or the Stooges. I forget, but I bought it and I still have it. It's here somewhere where they talk about Funhouse and all the extra takes, how they recorded it, like live in the studio. And this song, Lost in the Future. And they, I was obsessed. I asked anyone I knew in the music business, like music writers. And, and I'm like, do you know this song? They're like, don't know what you're talking about. And finally, with the, the box set, you get to hear it. Now I'm lost in the future. And I got it. And so you get to hear other ideas that the Stooges were putting across. There's another thing really interesting to me was uh, Don, I'm not going to repeat exactly what he said, you know, because it's, it's naughty words and it's just not how I want to talk during this. But he said, my job was basically not to beep this up. And he said, I made two suggestions total to the band in these recordings. One was for Dirt. Can we try Lonnie Max? amp he's a great great blues player but he was also electra staff he said we used lonnie max gear for the guitar for dirt because it has kind of a wetter sound and is such a good call and fun house and la blues otherwise known as freak used to be one song and in their live set they would go from fun house into what became la blues and the whole thing would just you know explode and it was like this big freak out and then everything would fall over it's the end of the show he suggested to them to record them separately because he thought the freak out section stood on its own as a musical thing and not just funhouse decaying into mayhem and maybe that impressed the stooges that he respected it so much he said those are my two suggestions to my credit i made two suggestions and got the hell out of the way and to their credit they took both of my suggestions yeah and so that's why you hear Funhouse and LA Blues as two different things. And asking a band, you know, basically, uh, one, two, three, go freak out in a studio with no one in the room. They do a pretty damn good job of it. Because if you hear live versions of the end of their shows from that time, it just makes more sense. You're in front of a crowd, you're sweating, and everything's going nuts. But to do that in this really sterile environment and still get the emotion of it, Pretty damn impressive. Whenever I first experienced the album, 
you know, on CD, I was just amazed that LA blues existed as a, just a single thought, yeah. you know, like it was such a bold move to just leave it as is, you know, I put it in the lineage of Sun Ra and everything that was going on. It's a bridge. It's a bridge to so much other great music that you can experience. If you dig fun house, it can open up an entirely different world that you can live within musically. Yeah, you can, you know, from that as a rock fan, you can love Fun House and an Ornette Coleman record will make sense to you. Yes. Any number of Sun Ra records will make sense to you. Uh, 66 era Coltrane and onward uh, would make sense to you. And I think Michigan, you know, the, the Michigan guys understood like Sun Ra. I mean, the MC5 and Sun Ra did shows together. So there was kind of that connection. And hats off to the Stooges for seeing Steve McKay play with his local band. Saxophonist. Yes. And having the talk with him. I think Iggy went over, watched him play one night. And then uh, I think Steve was working at a record store. Iggy went in there and said, hey, let's hang out. So they hung out, got along. And, and Steve was a, a, a real sweet guy, very humble and very hard swinging. And then so they brought him over to the fun house, like Stooges Manor. It's like, come and jam with the band. And that went well. And then he played one or two shows with the Stooges. They just brought him on and Steve found his way into the songs. And I think Steve was working one day at the record store and Ron or Scott or Ron and Scott went in and said, so pretty cool about you going to LA to be on the Stooges record. And he said, huh? And then <laughs> Iggy apparently called him and said, tomorrow at 10 a.m., there's a car coming. You're going to go to L.A. And he said, why? He said, because you're, you're going to be on the next Stooges record. Okay. And suddenly, he's an honorary Stooge in Hollywood on Funhouse. And that just kind of happened. And that's how stone cold crazy these guys are. But mm -hmm. they obviously saw something. I mean, this wasn't a thing that was worked out over months. I would love to know who at Electra knew that Steve was coming. I'm willing to wager. I wonder if no one knew. That's what it feels like. Yeah, I wonder if Holtzman and company thought they're just going to get the lineup who did the first album, yeah. and they show up with you know more chops, more attitude, and this like horn player. And they had to go, well, okay, and listen to how well it worked out. And he makes the songs he's on like crazy. You know, that the top of your head opens and whoo, they, it's a rocket ship out. And yeah. it's the horn was like this kind of crazy electric, like it's this, this scary electric infusion of grease that comes in and this loosens the band up even more. And he's kind of the slippery lightning that just allowed those songs to do their thing. Think of all the songs he's on without the horn. And oh just, yeah! No way! No, no way! way. Do its no thing. way! Like at the end, when you you hear uh, you go, "Come on, Steve!" or you know, "Steve, blow!" Was that is that yeah. fun house? Yeah. Yeah. It's the horn that's the the ingredient where you can't think of those songs working at all without Steve. Mm -hmm. It would just be rock. They wouldn't yeah. be exceptional. Yeah. Well, it also yeah. it also speaks to, you know, I always read that there were two things that well, three things that Iggy and the band were inspired by, or at least Iggy was inspired by. The song The Shadow of Your Smile, James Brown, a lot of late sixties James Brown. And drone music from the Nunsuch like uh, anthology series of like avant-garde composition from Harry Parch and everything like that. So all that kind of like fused together, you have Funhouse. At least you have the second side of Funhouse, you know, because Funhouse as a track, that sounds very much like you take Iggy off, it sounds like a, a rough and tumble James Brown band. 
you know, mm. the, the kind of the, the riff that Ron's playing, it is, it's there sonically. And if you, you know, gave him some suits, <laughs> you know, you just kind of like, if, yeah. if you think about that, you listen to Funhouse, that totally sped up could be a James Brown riff, right? Like, dun, 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 dun. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. For a band that at the time in the press was dubbed as just being, you know, <laughs> idiots <laughs> playing, you know, like just terrible rock and roll music. There's a lot of sophistication there. And there's a yeah. lot more going on than meets the initial ear. You know, this is a real sophisticated, adventurous, important band and album. There's a, a very well-known rock critic uh, lodged somewhere on the East Coast, and I'm, I'm not going to name him, who angered a lot of people with his reviews in a, a, a newspaper that uh, w went away a few years ago. I mean, he was there for like 180 years at least. And he would slap one star reviews on really good records all the time where he's kind of more ego than critic. Right. And he pasted Funhouse the first time around and he had to come around. I think he was interviewed when the box set was released on CD years and years later. And he went, you know what? I was wrong. This is a visionary, you know, completely amazing record. And so I think the Stooges kind of got the short end of the stick the first time around. And, you know, we're, you know, to me are the, the underdog band. They are the uh, hyenas on the Serengeti who make their dinner with what the lions leave behind, you know? So they're used right. to eating intestines and snouts <laughs> and uh, they, they can survive because they're so damn tough and they're so good and they can smell trouble because they've got, you know, they got the real chops. And, you know, arguably, chops as good as any band from the decade of the 1970s in their own way. You can't maybe have them as session men, but as far as a band able to navigate their own potential, the Stooges, I think, realized every atom of breathable air in any room they were in live and in the studio and it was the funhouse record where you get to realize that because they were unencumbered by studio norms of separation and that kind of sterilization of rock music if this album was as highly regarded back in its day as it is today don't you think that they wouldn't have been dropped from electra they would have stayed and made that third record uh you know uh there's a lot of things you can read about what the potential of a third record was. Paul Trinka's very fine book, Open Up and Bleed, Don Gallucci's testimony in an interview for the release of the CD box set from many years ago, you can find online. The, the Stooges and Electra ended, you know, parted ways the way a lot of bands part ways with labels. You know, you get the phone call, hey, you've been dropped, you know, send the, send the suits back. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, give the gear back to the renter guy and uh, yeah. you're, paying, you're, you're paying your own way now. And a third Stooges album, it would have been interesting. I just don't know if the Stooges, what it would have been, because I think something like Funhouse, you can't follow up Funhouse. It is of itself. Like, how, how does one follow up Funhouse? You just write new songs and record them. But you don't yeah. follow up to Funhouse. Like, how do you follow up with Kind of Blue or a Love Supreme? You, you don't even try. So what would the next Stooges experience? And Don Gallucci was, you know, they were batting around the idea of Don doing another record mm -hmm. with the Stooges because Funhouse yep. seemed to work out. What would that have been? Well, we can only speculate. I just, I think they captured a moment. And if they were foolish enough to try and recapture that moment, I think... They just would have wasted their time because you, you well, can't recapture it. You can only just move on and see what the next chapter holds. And so what we tried to do with the Funhouse box set, if I can speak on Jason's behalf a little bit, was with the liner notes and, and the presentation, we, wanna, we wanted to isolate this like 10 days in April, May 1970, where this... The raw band came out to this crazy city. We're living in a part of it where 
everyone on Santa Monica Boulevard looked like, you know, like they were some casting call for a crazy movie. It was just a wild time to be in Los Angeles. You know, the tension was thick. It was just a heavy place to live. And I know that neighborhood pretty well. And so we wanted to just have the listeners just be in that moment. And in the liner notes, I advise the listener just to just to put the records on, listen to the first album for context so they can dive into fun house, like just dive completely in and just lean into the speakers and get into this moment that there's no way that band or any band can recapture. There's a time in your life. I mean, the three of us are you know not 21 anymore. There's a time in your life. And I, I, I was in bands for a while. There's like, I don't know, 18 months, 24 months. There's like a period where you're so lean, you can stick your finger into your side and feel your ribs. You're just skinny and you don't care and you're mad and there's no tomorrow. Everything is right now. You're just a pain in the neck to everybody, basically. And when you, you make recordings, you can just, you can see the ribs up against the skin. You can just see the lean, nothing extra on this track. The Stooges hit that in Funhouse. And by the time you're like in your mid twenties, you simply aren't there anymore. And no amount of starvation or drugs or good fortune or bad fortune is going to get you to where you were between 20 and 23. I mean, it's just, it might be great, but it's not the same. Yeah. And so I just want the listeners to get in that moment with the Stooges. And I can only appreciate those times now, now that I am older, because I have so many years since I was that age. When I hear those songs, I'm like, yeah, that's like two, there's a two year window of your entire life to hit that. And the Stooges, right time, right place, right engineer, right producer, and, you know, seemingly the right studio. And rarely does a record where, you know, where everything lines up. Now, I said in the liner notes that the, the outtakes are not an expanded version of the album, but the album is an abbreviation of the sessions. Great way to put it. And, and to get the album, you know, you've heard the album many, many times in your life. But when you hear the sessions, now you're hearing Fun House. And there's only one way to understand Funhouse in this holistic way. You got to sit down and you got to pull out every single LP and you got to put them on and just do it. It's like seven hours. Yeah. Break it up over as many nights as you want. Mm -mm. Not too many nights. Just, like, just push it. And then Funhouse will register to you in your mind in a way that is literally impossible for it to do if you just listen to the, what, 33-minute LP version. Yeah. It's, wow. And um, that is profound. And not even the CD version got me there on that visceral, like, wow, this is bigger than me. I mean, I, I see, you know, I'm sitting in my living room alone doing uh, two to three LPs a night with my jaw on the ground. Well, that's only the first part of our conversation with Henry Rollins and Jason Jones about the 50th anniversary edition of Funhouse. Go to rhino.com if you are interested in picking up a copy. There aren't that many left. And make sure to tune in next episode so you can hear the rest of the story. Thanks very much for tuning in. Don't forget to listen and subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss the next Rhino podcast. Producer for Rhino Entertainment, John Hughes. Produced for Rhino Entertainment by Rich Mayhem Promotions. All rights reserved.